Chapter 15 Old Friends Are Reunited Many servants dressed in handsome uniforms stood ready to welcome the new arrivals, and when the wizard got out of the buggy, a pretty girl in a green gown cried out in surprise, Why, it's Oz, the wonderful wizard! Come back again! The little man looked at her closely and then took both the maiden's hands in his and shook them cordially. On my word, he exclaimed, it's little Jellia Jam, as pert and pretty as ever. Why not, Mr. Wizard? asked Jellia, bowing low. But I'm afraid you cannot rule the Emerald City as you used to, because we now have a beautiful princess whom everyone loves dearly. And the people will not willingly part with her, added a tall soldier in a captain general's uniform. The wizard turned to look at him. Did you not wear green whiskers at one time? he asked. Yes, said the soldier, but I shaved them off long ago, and since then I have risen from a private to be the chief general of the royal armies. That's nice, said the little man, but I assure you, my good people, that I do not wish to rule the Emerald City, he added earnestly. In that case, you are very welcome, cried all the servants, and it pleased the wizard to note the respect with which the royal retainers bowed before him. His fame had not been forgotten in the land of Oz by any means. Where is Dorothy? inquired Zeb anxiously as he left the buggy and stood beside his friend, the little wizard. She is with Princess Ozma in the private rooms of the palace, replied Jellia Jam. But she has ordered me to make you welcome and show you to your apartments. The boy looked around him with wondering eyes. Such magnificence and wealth as was displayed in this palace was more than he had ever dreamed of, and he could scarcely believe that all the gorgeous glitter was real and not tinsel. "'What's to become of me?' asked the horse uneasily. He had seen considerable of life in the cities in his younger days, and knew that this regal palace was no place for him. It perplexed even Jellia Jam for a time to know what to do with the animal. The green maiden was much astonished at the sight of so unusual a creature, for horses were unknown in this land, but those who lived in the Emerald City were apt to be astonished by odd sights. So, after inspecting the cab horse and noting the mild look in his big eyes, the girl decided not to be afraid of him. There are no stables here, said the wizard, unless some have been built since I went away. We've never needed them before, answered Jellia. For the sawhorse lives in a room of the palace, being much smaller and more natural in appearance than this great beast you have brought with you. Do you mean that I'm a freak? asked Jim angrily. Oh no, she hastened to say. There may be many more like you in the place you came from, but in Oz, any horse but a sawhorse is unusual. This mollified Jim a little. And after some thought, the green maiden decided to give the cab horse a room in the palace, such a big building having many rooms that were seldom in use. So Zeb unharnessed Jim, and some of the servants then led the horse around to the rear, where they selected a nice large apartment that he could have all to himself. Then Jellia said to the wizard, Your own room, which was back of the great throne room, has been vacant ever since you left us. Would you like it again? Yes, indeed, returned the little man. It will seem like being at home again, for I lived in that room for many, many years. He knew the way to it, and a servant followed him, carrying his satchel. Zeb was also escorted to a room so grand and beautiful that he almost feared to sit in the chairs or lie upon the bed, lest he might dim their splendor. In the closets he discovered many fancy costumes of rich velvets and brocades, and one of the attendants told him to dress himself in any of the clothes that pleased him and to be prepared to dine with the princess and Dorothy in an hour's time. Opening from the chamber was a fine bathroom, having a marble tub with perfumed water, so the boy, still dazed by the novelty of his surroundings, indulged in a good bath and then selected a maroon velvet costume with silver buttons to replace his own soiled and much-worn clothing. There were silk stockings and soft leather slippers with diamond buckles to accompany his new costume, and when he was fully dressed, Zeb looked much more dignified and imposing than ever before in his life. 
He was all ready when an attendant came to escort him to the presence of the princess. He followed bashfully and was ushered into a room more dainty and attractive than it was splendid. Here he found Dorothy seated beside a young girl so marvelously beautiful that the boy stopped suddenly with a gasp of admiration. But Dorothy sprang up and ran to seize her friend's hand, drawing him impulsively toward the lovely princess, who smiled most graciously upon her guest. Then the wizard entered, and his presence relieved the boy's embarrassment. The little man was clothed in black velvet with many sparkling emerald ornaments decorating his breast, but his bald head and wrinkled features made him appear more amusing than impressive. Ozma had been quite curious to meet the famous man who had built the Emerald City and united the Munchkins, Gillikins, Quadlings, and Winkies into one people. So when they were all four seated at the dinner table, the princess said, Please tell me, Mr. Wizard, whether you called yourself Oz after this great country, or whether you believe my country is called Oz after you. It is a matter I've long wished to inquire about, because you are a strange race, and my own name is Ozma. No one, I am sure, is better to explain this mystery than you. That is true, answered the little wizard. Therefore, it will give me pleasure to explain my connection with your country. In the first place, I must tell you that I was born in Omaha, and my father, who was a politician, named me Oscar Zorester Phaedrig Isaac Norman Henkel Emanuel Ambrose Diggs, Diggs being the last name because he could think of no more to go before it. Taken all together, it was a dreadfully long name to weigh down a poor innocent child, and one of the hardest lessons I ever learned was to remember my own name. When I grew up, I just called myself Oz, because the other initials were P-I-N-H-E-A-D, and that spelled Pinhead, which was a reflection of my intelligence. Surely no one could blame you for cutting your name short, said Ozma sympathetically. But didn't you cut it almost too short? Perhaps so, replied the wizard. When I was a young man, I ran away from home and joined a circus. I used to call myself a wizard and do tricks of ventriloquism. What does that mean? asked the princess, throwing my voice in any object I pleased to make it appear that the object was speaking instead of me. Also, I began to make balloon ascensions. On my balloon and on all the other articles I used in the circus, I painted the two initials OZ to show that those things belonged to me. One day, my balloon ran away with me and brought me across the deserts to this beautiful country. When the people saw me from the sky, they naturally thought me some superior creature and bowed down before me. I told them I was a wizard and showed them every trick that amazed them, and when they saw the initials painted on the balloon, they called me Oz. Now I begin to understand, said the princess, smiling. At the time, continued the wizard, busily eating his soup while talking, there were four separate countries in this land, each one of the four being ruled by a witch. But the people thought my power was greater than that of the witches, and perhaps the witches thought so too, for they never dared oppose me. I ordered the Emerald City to be built just where the four countries cornered together, and when it was completed, I announced myself ruler of the Land of Oz, which included all the four countries of the Munchkins, the Gillikins, the Winkies, and the Quadlings. Over this land, I ruled in peace for many years, until I grew old and longed to see my native city once again. So when Dorothy was first blown to this place by a cyclone, I arranged to go away with her in a balloon, but the balloon escaped too soon and carried me back alone. After many adventures, I reached Omaha, only to find that my old friends were dead or had moved away. So, having nothing else to do, I joined a circus again and made my balloon ascensions until the earthquake caught me. That is quite a history, said Ozma, but there's a little more history about the land of Oz that you do not seem to understand, perhaps for the reason that no one ever told it to you. Many years before you came here, this land was united under one ruler, as it is now, and the ruler's name was always Oz, which means in our language great and good. Or, if the ruler happened to be a woman, her name was always Ozma. But once upon a time, four witches leagued together to depose the king and rule the four parts of the kingdom themselves. So when the ruler, my grandfather, was hunting one day, one wicked witch named Mombi stole him and carried him away, keeping him a close prisoner. 
Then the witches divided up the kingdom and ruled the four parts of it until you came here. That was why the people were so glad to see you, and why they thought from your initials that you were their rightful ruler. But at that time, said the wizard thoughtfully, there were two good witches and two wicked witches ruling in the land. Yes, replied Ozma, because a good witch had conquered Mombi in the north, and Glinda the Good had conquered the evil witch in the south. But Mombi was still my grandfather's jailer, and afterwards my father's jailer. When I was born, she transformed me into a boy, hoping that no one would ever recognize me and know that I was the rightful princess of the land of Oz. But I escaped from her and am now the ruler of my people. I'm very glad of that, said the wizard, and hope you will consider me one of your most faithful and devoted subjects. We owe a great deal to the wonderful wizard, continued the princess, for it was you who built this splendid emerald city. Your people built it, he answered. I only bossed the job, as we say in Omaha. But you ruled it wisely and well for many years, said she, and made the people proud of your magical art. So, as you are now too old to wander abroad and work in a circus, I offer you a home here as long as you live. You shall be the official wizard of my kingdom, and be treated with every respect and consideration. I accept your kind offer with gratitude, gracious princess, the little man said in a soft voice, and they could all see that teardrops were standing in his keen old eyes. It meant a good deal to him to secure a home like this. He's only a humbug wizard, though, said Dorothy, smiling at him. And that is the safest kind of a wizard to have, replied Ozma promptly. Oz can do some good tricks, humbug or no humbug, announced Zeb, who was now feeling more at ease. He shall amuse us with his tricks tomorrow, said the princess. I have sent messengers to summon all of Dorothy's old friends to meet her and give her welcome, and they ought to arrive very soon now. Indeed, the dinner was no sooner finished than in rushed the scarecrow to hug Dorothy in his padded arms and tell her how glad he was to see her again. The wizard was also most heartily welcomed by the straw man, who was an important personage in the land of Oz. How are your brains? inquired the little humbug as he grasped the soft, stuffed hands of his old friend. Working finely, answered the scarecrow. I'm very certain, Oz, that you gave me the best brains in the world, for I can think with them day and night when all other brains are fast asleep. How long did you rule the Emerald City after I left here, was the next question. Quite a while, until I was conquered by a girl named General Ginger. But Ozma soon conquered her with the help of Glinda the Good, and after that I went to live with Nick Chopper, the Tin Woodman. Just then a loud cackling was heard outside, and when a servant threw open the door with a low bow, a yellow hen strutted in. Dorothy sprang forward and caught the fluffy fowl in her arms, uttering at the same time a glad cry. Oh, Belina, she said, how fat and sleek you've grown! Why shouldn't I? asked the hen in a sharp, clear voice. I live on the fat of the land, don't I, Ozma? You have everything you wish for, said the princess. Around Belina's neck was a string of beautiful pearls, and on her legs were bracelets of emeralds. She nestled herself comfortably in Dorothy's lap until the kitten gave a snarl of jealous anger and leaped up with a sharp claw fiercely bared to strike Belina a blow. But the little girl gave the angry kitten such a severe cuff that it jumped down again without daring to scratch. How horrid of you, Eureka, cried Dorothy. Is that the way to treat my friends? You have odd friends, seems to me, replied the kitten in a surly tone. Seems to me the same way, said Belina scornfully, if that beastly cat is one of them. Look here, said Dorothy sternly. I won't have any quarreling in the land of Oz, I can tell you. Everybody lives in peace here and loves everybody else. And unless you two, Belina and Eureka, make up and be friends, I'll take my magic belt and wish you both home again immediately. So there. They were both much frightened at the threat and promised meekly to be good. But it was never noticed that they became very warm friends for all of that. 
And now the tin woodman arrived, his body most beautifully nickel-plated, so that it shone splendidly in the brilliant light of the room. The tin woodman loved Dorothy most tenderly and welcomed with joy the return of the little old wizard. Sir, said he to the latter, I never can thank you enough for the excellent heart you once gave me. It has made me many friends, I assure you, and it beats as kindly and lovingly today as it ever did. I'm glad to hear that, said the wizard. I was afraid it would get moldy in that tin body of yours. Not at all, returned Nick Chopper. It keeps finely being preserved in my airtight chest. Zeb was a little shy when first introduced to these odd people, but they were so friendly and sincere that he soon grew to admire them very much, even finding some good qualities in the yellow hen. But he became nervous again when the next visitor was announced. This, said Princess Ozma, is my friend Mr. H. M. Wogglebug, T.E., who assisted me one time when I was in great distress and is now the dean of the Royal College of Athletic Science. Ah, said the wizard, I'm pleased to meet so distinguished a personage. H.M., said the Wogglebug pompously, means highly magnified, and T.E. means thoroughly educated. I am in reality a very big bug, and doubtless the most intelligent being in all this broad domain. How well you disguise it, said the wizard, but I don't doubt your word in the least. Nobody doubts it, sir, replied the Wogglebug, and drawing a book from its pocket, the strange insect turned its back on the company and sat down in a corner to read. Nobody minded this rudeness, which might have seemed more impolite and one less thoroughly educated, so they straightway forgot him and joined in merry conversation that kept them well amused until bedtime arrived.